Um, early literacy is my wheelhouse. So before I worked in libraries in Vermont, I did preschool outreach uh, for a very large library system in Virginia, uh, working with Bookmobile. And I did um, story time with over 400 children, zero to five every month at all of the preschool and child care sites. So, early literacy programming is... Sorry, I... <laughs> <laughs> the killing cats. Trying to get your pictures I up. Can't, can't you that. That's my um, So, um, Cass talked a lot about some of the things that I wanted to talk about, because I think that when... And she has some good early literacy resources. Uh, so I won't go over what she went over, though that was part of what I was going to talk about. I always think of early literacy story time as being from a developmental perspective. Children occupy space very differently than adults, as we can see, and especially our youngest library patrons. Um, part of our job is making sure that our libraries and our staff and our volunteers and the rest of the community understand that, that truth and that parents and children feel supported in your building. Um, because the worst thing that can happen is that parents will decide, well, my kid is too wild for the library. This often happens when they transition out of baby story time and into toddler story time. You hear it all the time. My kid is too crazy for the library. And that's what happens then is a, is a dangerous thing. Because if your kid is too crazy for the library at 19 months, are you ever going to decide that the library is right for your kid again in that early literacy period? Mm -hmm. So, how can we do that? At the Platt Library, we're a small library. I'm a part-time librarian. We serve a community of 1,260 people. And all of our youngest programming, the zero to three programming, happens when the library is closed. So that parents know that it is a low-stress environment, their kids, if they, if they have a 22-month-old child that is in the circling phase, that they can just circle the stacks and check in with us as we're going. And it's been very successful. At different times in our community, when our demographics have been different, um, we've had up to 13 kids who show up for that story time, which in a library our size is a lot of kids. Um, that group right now is getting ready to go to kindergarten. So we have a lot of kids who show up for preschool programming on the weekend. One of the things that we've discovered is with the funding that's coming from the state for preschool education, we have fewer and fewer kids who are available for during the week preschool programming. So we've been moving towards doing programming on the weekends when they might actually be available. Okay, so I have two handouts. The first is an exhaustive book list of all of the books that I brought with me today. I really feel like this is a super easy theme to do for early literacy. Um, and so mostly what I focused on was some cool new books that we're going to be using this summer that I thought you might be interested in too. My hope is that there are at least a few new titles for everybody in the room. And um, if that's not the case, then I apologize. <laughs> um, you'll notice that these books are, yes, that's, would you like to pass them out? Thank you. These books are grouped by in three groups. When I think of early childhood, when I think of early literacy, I think of three groups. And those are developmental groups. So um, the little littles, those are your zero to threes. The reason why I define them zero to three is because in human beings, developmentally, usually your eyes are fully developed by about three. So under three, your, the, the eyes of children are still developing. Their focal length is not as long as us. So they don't get to about 20-20 vision until about age three. And obviously not every kid gets to 20-20 vision, which is fine. But even kids who are normally developing, who will never wear glasses, their eyes are not fully developed until three. So we need to be aware of this for story time. You may have a great book. It's got great language, but the pictures are itty-bitty. It's not going to work for this group. Not unless you have copies of the book for the kids to look at on laps. Okay, the second group that I uh, defined was the littles, the three to fours. And then the last group are the big littles. They're the five and six-year-olds. 
Because what we have found is that they attend our preschool programming because they often have younger siblings. So to think about, but they all need, all three of these groups need kind of different things. So that's how I've done this. Does everybody have a sheet? Is anybody missing a sheet? Great. Are there supposed to be two? There are supposed to be two. I haven't handed out the second one yet. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. My small person today is almost five, so she's right on that cusp of tall to big books. <laughs> so just in general, books for little littles. We want high contrast, large images, or books to hold close and lapse. And we want rhyming language. We want to create a print-rich, literacy-rich environment, hitting all of those five assets. Um, I also always use board books in my story times for little littles because it helps um, promote that collection to parents. Mm -hmm. Story time for little littles should be about half talking to the parents and about half talking to the kids. Um, there are some, these are just some of the favorites that we've had in our library. All of the little Raffi story time books are wonderful. And where I have mentioned a book that has a song, I've tried to include a YouTube link for you so that if you're not familiar with the song, you can look it up and figure it out. And on the back, I have a little reminder. Who knows about safeyoutube.net? <coughs> oh, that's good. This is a really important piece of information for you. Mm -hmm. So if you it's are really ever showing <laughs> YouTube content in your library, please, please, please copy paste that link into safeyoutube.net. What it does is it strips out all the ads and it strips out the autoplay. So you just get what you want to show instead of something horrifying. Um, I know that there, there are a lot of... so great for school age. <laughs> yes, it's, really, it's, it's mostly a tip for school age. There's a lot of mixed feelings among educators about showing video content to children zero to five. I'm not here to tell you what you, want, what you should do in your library. I'm not here to tell you what you should tell your parents to do. All I'm here to say is that if you're going to use YouTube content in front of the public, please copy paste it into safeyoutube.net. Okay, um, so this is a brand new one. I don't know if anybody's seen it yet, Every Little Thing. It's a board book version of Barb Marley's song, and it's really beautiful and really fun, and we're excited about using it this year. And Sandra Boynton's Snuggle Puppy. Does everybody know the song for Snuggle Puppy? <laughs> it's on the... You know the song for Snuggle Puppy, right? I used to have that book. You used to have this book, yeah. So, so um, what, what is the consensus? Would you like me to do some storytelling and singing for you, or would you just like me to blast through all of this? Storytelling and singing, raise your hand. You can be, sure. please be honest. Sure. Blast through it as quickly as possible, raise your hand. No, that's fine. That's good. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a little bit of we'll do a little bit. So who here is comfortable singing in front of children? Who here is not? Good. Your parents. That's true. I will tell you the great secret of singing in public, which is that especially for the little kids. They do not care right. how well you sing. They do not care whether you know the tune or whether you've made it up. Yeah. <laughs> what they care about is how enthusiastic you are about it. And, um, and, and we should sing, when we sing with these kids, we should model the way that they sing. They sing enthusiastically, they move their bodies, they're very expressive. Do you remember how it starts? You know the chorus, right? You're going to have to help me with the chorus, okay? The other thing that I always do is, so we're emphasizing that phonological awareness, you want to make sure that you're, even if it's not the singing part, that you're using rhythmic speaking. So for example, when I read Snuggle Puppy, I say, well, I have the thing to tell you and it won't take long. The way I feel about you is a kind of a song. It starts with a and ends with a kiss. And all along the middle, it goes something like, Ooh, snuggle puppy of mine, everything about you is especially fine. I love what you are, I love what you do. Ooh, fuzzy little snuggle puppy, I love you. I sing, ooh, 
Snuggle puppy of mine. Everything about you is especially fine. I love what you are. I love what you do. Ooh, fuzzy snuggle puppy, I love you. And then there's a little coda at the end. <laughs> so, um, and you will have favorites that you use too. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to dig out all of your favorite songs, all of your favorite <laughs> rhymes from your story times throughout the year and structure it into a summer reading program. Um, okay, a couple more books. Uh, Jazz Baby, does everybody know Jazz Baby? It's not new, but it is a lovely book. Um, and it's a great book for the little littles because it has lots of motions. So itty bitty baby's hands, clap, clap, clap. Grandpa toot toots, Granny sings scat, Baby Bop and Baby goes rat a tat tat. This would be a really fun game to, or song to do with um, story time instruments. Okay, let's do hands. Who has bells for story time? Okay. Who has rhythm sticks for story time? Who has shakers for story time? <laughs> Who has scarves for story time? Okay, great. What am I forgetting? Anything else that your group has? Who has kazoos for story time? <laughs> ah, brave soul. Depends <laughs> on the story time, right? Um, Shaky eggs. Yeah. Uh, so, um, one way that you could structure your story time programming would be to pick one of those things and build story times for the week around that. So have shaker week for your little guys, have scarf week for your little guys, have bell week for your little guys. That's one of the things that we're going to be doing. Okay, um, the Itsy Bitsy Spider, any, any books that you have that are familiar songs, there are studies that show that children who know at least eight nursery rhymes by age four are significant better readers when they are reading fluently in elementary school. At least eight nursery rhymes by age four. Mm -hmm. That is something that we can support families in doing, and that's something that you can do in your library. Okay, moving on to the little littles. This is the group that everybody likes to do story time for because they can actually sit, they can actually listen, they can actually participate because they're developmentally ready for that. There was an old lady who swallowed a fly. This is my favorite version of this book, and we have a little way to retell the story, which I just drew. We do a lot of um, low-cost <laughs> retelling, so I often will use paper with magnets on the back of it on our magnetic whiteboard instead of taking the time to cut out felt pieces. So this is the old lady who swallowed a fly, and we have little cut-out pictures for each of the animals in the book, which the kids can then come up, and we can talk about what order that they go in, and then they go where? Right in her mouth. <laughs> we all sing with the same voice with the CD. Anybody remember this one from the from Dis from a uh, Sesame Street from the seventies? My hair is black and brown, red. My hair is yellow. My eyes are brown and green and blue. My name is Jack and Fred. My name's Amanda Sue. I'm called Kareem Abdu. My name is you. It's a really beautiful international perspective book, and it comes with the CD. But it's an easy one to look up on uh, YouTube as well. The link is there. John Lithgow. Who has John Lithgow musical books in your library? <coughs> They're great. He's just a really uh, he is a fun, uh, he does a fun book, and this particular one comes with a CD. Uh, the link that I've put in there is actually him at a story time. So, Sweet Pea, I need you to have your voice be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you. So, the kid and his family go to the zoo, but they'll go to a concert near the zoo, and uh-oh, chaos ensues, because what do all the animals want to do when they hear all of the people playing? What do you think? They run away. They want to run away. They want to run away? They're running toward the music because what do the animals want to do? Dance and play the music. Dance and play the music too. Look at <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's hilarious. The pictures in the book are very hilarious. The song is really funny. Um, I haven't learned this one yet, so I'm not going to sing it for you. But, um, but the nice thing about the books with the CD is you don't need to learn the song. You can just put the CD on. Mm -hmm. 
Who has used recorded music played live in your story time? Please, please, please do it, especially if you're not comfortable singing or you don't, uh, or there's part of it, you know, there's part that you, you don't feel comfortable doing, like in this one it has some animal sounds in it too, and it has the instrument sounds, so it adds something else to the text. All right. Octopus's Garden by Ringo Starr. Anyone familiar with this one? It's a really, there are several versions of this song, including one by Rafi. This one I really like for the clear illustrations. There are a lot of Beatles songs that are very kid friendly. I really like the Beatles. That is a true, that is a true story. Quentin Marsalis has a picture book, Squeak, Rumble, Womp, 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 <laughs> which is a great one to talk about the different sounds of the instruments in the orchestra. And again, really clear pictures. Womp, Womp, Womping, tubas fill up the place. One of the things that we're planning to do at Platt Library this summer is we're going to do an instrument petting zoo. So our music teacher in our elementary school is going to come with a whole bunch of instruments during preschool story time, and we're going to, she's going to demonstrate them all and let the kids see them and touch them and maybe try and play them. Um, that, those kind of programs are really easy to do. Max found two sticks, classic. Mm -hmm. Which is a wonderful one to do if you have rhythm sticks and safe places for rhythm sticks to go. Uh, I recommend that you have a little rhyme for your uh, whatever, whatever you're passing out for kids. Most people do. You have a rhyme at the beginning that you do to help them get oriented for what they're using. I, I don't know if some of the things I'm saying are new or if everybody knows it. So if you're like... Huh? If you could make your face say, huh, bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome yeah. to my room. <laughs> yeah. um, singing in the Rain. This is a relatively new edition. There's several in this series, What a Wonderful World and Walking in a Winter Wonderland. And the beautifully, beautifully illustrated um, versions of those classic songs. <laughs> I just love this kind of treatment of that text. Uh, Doreen Cronin's three books, Bounce, Stretch, and Wiggle. Did everybody have these ones? These are big favorites for our preschool crowd. Um, and I think that um, just like song is an easy sell for the, um, for the early literacy group, so is movement, um, especially directed movement. Kids have a lot of energy, which if you don't give them a direction, they expend in all sorts of other ways. <laughs> Another fun thing about this particular group, the littles, the three to fours, is they have some prior knowledge. So you can read books like Old MacDonald Had a Wood Shop, and they get the joke because they know that Old MacDonald Had a Farm is the song. Or you can read The Seals on the Bus. It's such an, if you don't know this book, please, it's one of my favorites, because it's so funny. The family goes on the bus, and instead of the wheels on the bus making all these sounds, the bus is occupied by animals that make all kinds of hilarious sounds, like the tiger on the bus goes roar, 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 roar. And at the end, the people on the bus flee in terror. <laughs> the people on the bus say, help, 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 help. <laughs> all around the town. <laughs> um, these kind of books are super fun to do if your kids are already familiar with the other songs, so you have to time it to make sure that they know what you're talking about. If you read this book to a kid who doesn't know the song, The Wheels on the Bus, it's not as funny. <laughs> um, and just another classic song, Jerry Pinkney's version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, which is another beautiful one. Well, look, hey! <laughs> <laughs> Only non-male pers person present. Don't look at that. <laughs> That's you, mommy. That's me. And where is this picture taken? Where is it? At the Plot Library. At the Plot Library. Where I work. At the Plot Library, where I work. So the second handout that I have, I'm going to transition away from. Do you want pictures yet? Not quite yet. <laughs> um, so for your big littles, 
They have a more finely developed sense of humor. They have even more um, information to access. La 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 is a relatively new book by Kate DiCamillo. Um, I'm hoping all of you know it. It's one that has almost no text in it. So the only words in it are La 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 La. But it tells the story with pictures of a little girl who sings her little song into the void. Waiting for response back. And she keeps singing her song as loudly as she can and exploring the world, even though there seems to be no one to sing with her. And at the end, how does she feel? Sad. Sad. She feels really sad. It's hard to sing alone. We love to sing together, it's a very human thing. But she decides she's not going to give up and she's going to go back out into the world and sing her song no matter what and enjoy the beauty of the world. And then, then, what rises out of the ground into the night sky but <coughs> the most beautiful moon? I just love some of these pictures. She runs back and gets her ladder and climbs up because maybe, just maybe, the moon hasn't answered her because he can't hear. No, maybe the moon is silent. Maybe we really are alone in the universe, <laughs> stuck in <laughs> existential dread for the rest of our lives. <laughs> Maybe there really is no point in singing your song. <sighs> the pacing in this book is beautifully slow. But la comes the, the answer from the void, from the world, la, la, la. And there is the moon shining down, singing back her song. So wordless picture books, um, I find teachers like them a lot better than librarians. Librarians are usually like, a oh, book without words, you know, I'm not going to be doing that for story time. But a book without words is a really important book for your big littles because it allows them to build narrative, which is a huge piece of early and emergent literacy. It's being able to say, first this happened, then that happened, then this happened because that happened, and finally this happened. That's one of those early literacy assets. So I encourage you, um, you know, and it's a, it's a way to introduce children to the appreciation of the illustrations in picture books in, in a more sophisticated way, which is why I recommend wordless picture books for your older kids. Can I ask a question? Yes, them? please. How do, you, um, how do you treat that in the story hour? Obviously, you're not going to say some of the things you said. No, no. <laughs> so, you know, how do you pace it and how much do you say? So, generally, um, I, I, for wordless picture books, I'm always prepared to narrate the entire story. Mm -hmm. I'll do a little bit of question asking and prompting to see, because very often you might have kids who are eager to help you tell the story. Oh, look, and then the moon comes, and then the moon comes down. And, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if any of you have ever done um, uh, improv. Has anybody ever done improv? <laughs> One of the rules in improv is that when somebody else is making something up, your job is to say yes and, and then take it in whatever direction you want. So very often, if you open it up to five and six-year-olds to tell the story, they might say something like, um, you know, like, oh, well, she's sad and she's thinking about her dog, like the dog that I had ran <laughs> away last week and my mom said the dog is never coming back and she's really, really sad about that. Then I would say, yes, and she looks out of the door into the night sky. <laughs> um, but sometimes you have kids who are not comfortable doing that or they're not ready to do that or they're not sure how to do that. And so I would do, an, you know, I would say, and then she stands, and you know, in the night. And what do you see where she is? Is she in a city? No, she's not in a city. She's in a forest. Oh, she's in a forest, but she's walking along and singing her song. And, um, but 
I think, I think when you do, especially with the big littles, it can go either way. Sometimes they're very chatty, sometimes they're not. And I'm always prepared to kind of carry the narrative because that's important too, to model it. Um, and if there are parents in story time, I talk about at the beginning, you know, wordless picture books are a wonderful way for your children to show you what great readers they are. Because reading the pictures in a book is an important pre-literacy skill. And even kids who can't read words can read you the pictures and tell you the story. And they're building those skills to, um, to have narrative. Did that answer your question? <laughs> um, waking up is hard to do. So Neil Sadaka very <laughs> adorably <laughs> has done a, a new version with some new kid-friendly words to his classic song. And I'm really in love with this book. I'm very excited to use it in story time. <laughs> don't you cry and don't be blue. Waking up is hard to do. <laughs> Just brush your teeth and then get dressed. When you comb your hair, you'll look the best. Now you know it's really true. Waking up is hard to do. And this one uh, does include a CD. If your Neil Sadaka interpretation oh, is not strong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but especially for your big littles, they're going to kindergarten in the fall, or maybe they've completed kindergarten and they're headed to first grade. So their morning routine is, is described in this book. All the kids are going to school. So that's accessing a nice piece of their prior knowledge to connect with this story. Great. Chicka chicka boom boom. Boom boom. Uh, a classic. It's... Uh, you, why is Abby including Chicka Chicka Boom Boom in a music story time? Because it is so rhythmic. It is so beautifully rhythmic and it's a beautiful book to do with some kind of handheld percussion instruments. And for those older kids it accesses their prior knowledge about letter awareness. All the lowercase and all the uppercase letters out of context, which is something that they're supposed to be able to do by the end of the year. What does the fox say? <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of years ago when this book came, when the song, when the video came out, and the song oh came my out, God. this book came out. Um, oh. It is literally just the text of the song, but um, my four-year-old really loves this song. And the video is kid-friendly. It's a little creepy in the middle, but there's nothing untoward that happens. Um, and it's a nice way to introduce, you know, the concept of nonsense words, these rhythmic nonsense words that happen in the middle, to talk about animal sounds, and to maybe introduce them to some pop music, if you wanted to do that. So anyway, this very bizarre version of that song. The, uh, the original YouTube video is linked in your handout, but I, there is no CD on in this book. Um, Sandra Boynton, I only brought Philadelphia chickens. Does everybody have this and is aware of this? I know, right? <laughs> so she has written some very hilarious, wonderful songs and they're beautifully reproduced in these CDs. You can find them on YouTube, you can find any of these books. Um, there's Philadelphia Chickens is the first one, and then there are at least two others, and um, just great kid music. Please don't do that. Can you sit up, please? She's got a great Facebook page, too. Yeah. And just high interest for kids. And there's the music in the back if you do read music. If you don't, it's okay. Um, but for older kids, it might be useful to talk about that, to say that just like we read words, they're beginning to read some words, you can also read the, the pattern of the song. Just a nice way to introduce that. We are also doing rocks at Platt Library this for one week this summer because rocks are fun. And um, these are some relatively new rock books. So if you would like something, you can ask with your words. After I'm done showing it to all of these other people who are listening. So this is Ishii, which is simple tips from a solid friend. Adorably hilarious, tiny rock that is pictured in different places. And it has a little motivational 
piece to it. I'm going to read you the text of this one because it's very boosting. My name is Ishii. Ishii means rock in Japanese. And it talks about where he was born and how big he is, and it gives his Facebook page. <laughs> and rest and try again the next day. When I feel bottled up, I move my body. Run, climb, swim, run, swim, and climb a tree. When I feel stinky, I treat myself to something yummy. When I feel the pressure, I close my eyes and slowly, deeply, and quietly breathe. When I feel lonely, like a leftover, I reach out to my friends. When I feel like a failure, I remind myself that every experience helps me grow. When I feel like I just need a break, I take a break. <laughs> when I feel like I'm the only one who's different, I remind myself that everyone is different. When I feel stuck, I tell myself to always move forward, never backwards. When nothing makes me feel better, I go outside. Nature has magic. When I feel hopeless, I surround myself with dreamers. When I feel sad, thinking about what's missing, I remind myself to focus on what I love and appreciate it. When I feel lost, I lean on my friends. When I feel empty, I give. When I feel unhappy, I smile. Happiness will follow. Happiness is a choice. Be happy. And a big part of the reason why I've included this particular book, yes, you may look at it, is because one of the developmental uh, jobs of five-year-olds has to do with processing some big emotions. Five-year-olds feel very, very deeply, and they have a lot of, they have few coping skills for their big emotions. There's some things that happen uh, hormonally, developmentally, so sometimes um, you'll get children who have a lot of anger, uh, who are quick to tears, who, it's a, it's a very common developmental thing during that stage. And so anything that we can do in story time to help them name, and cope with those feelings is going to help them move through that stage as smoothly as possible. A rock is lively. Big littles are often very interested in rocks and minerals. And this is a wonderful introduction to them. And I'm sure you have other great books in your library about rocks and minerals. And this one, which is also a relatively new one, If Rocks Could Sing. Has anyone seen this one? Good. It's um, found rocks, so all of these rocks were found, and it's the alphabet, and each rock looks like a letter in the alphabet, or, and also like something else, so like, this rock looks like a bird. But it's a really nice, um, and there's some really amazing ones. It would be a nice uh, book to read if you were doing an activity outside, finding rocks, I don't know what your libraries look like or what it looks like outside. Would you like to look at and that? And this one looks like a shoe. This one looks like a shoe, you think? <laughs> Um, so another activity that's listed on the back of the sheet is, so, um, I did not put anything in from the manual because you can all read the manual for yourselves, but three ideas for programs that we're going to use this year are the Instrument Petting Zoo. We are also going to do Shoreham Rocks again. We did this last year. It's a community art project. Have kids bring in rocks or find rocks around your library. Have them paint them with acrylic paint. Uh, they dry at the library, seal them. You write your town name and the year on the back. They pick them up and then place them somewhere in town. And then you do a big promotion about several communities around the country do this. We did it last year and it was really fun and the kids were really into it. I didn't do it. No, you were at preschool, sorry. Um, so. But that's, a, that's an easy way to tie in rocks if you decide you do want to do a geology story thing. Um, and then excavations. So um, my child 
got one of those rock mining kits for Christmas this past year. And what we're going to do with the um, Big Littles this year is we are going to do some excavating with rocks. We have <coughs> kid size safety glasses at our library, and I included a link on the handout if you don't have kid size safety glasses. But we've got some gemstones that we're going to encase in plaster of Paris. This would be a really easy, hands-on, kind of destructive activity, um, which the Big Littles really love doing. Um, no, this one was bought, but I am going to, the ones we're going to use for, um, for summer reading, I'm going to make. Um, this was just a serendipitous present that I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that this summer. I have a similar idea. Okay. No, you may not, because it makes a terrible mess. It is really only a project for outside. And unfortunately, our kit is waiting for better weather. Um, you could also uh, hide dinosaurs. Dinosaurs would be another way, another rock-themed program if you want to do dinosaurs. Obviously, a high-interest topic. Okay, what else do I have up here? I have these. These are the fine 20 jars and fine 60 jars. This is a really easy, um, low-stress drop-in program for... Uh, for elementary school. I'm kind of transitioning away from early literacy to talk about some of the other things we do. Sorry, Brie. But it'll be a nice entree to what you do. Yep. Yes. So there are 60 different items in here. Some of them are multiples. And we have handed out sheets for kids where they have to write down everything they find or work with an adult to write everything that they find. If they get it right, then they get entered into a raffle prize. But we did these two or three summers ago. I can't remember. <laughs> but I wasn't there. No, you were very small. Um, two or three summers ago, and kids loved them. And we had kids who would not participate in story time, who were not really interested in doing our summer reading incentive program, but they wanted to sit with the fine 20 and the fine 60 jar. Mm. Developmentally, what this does is it works on visual discernment. So visual discernment is one of those skills that builds throughout elementary school, and it really helps with literacy strength. So the ability to say, oh, that's a blue button. Yeah, I recognize that. To focus intensely on one object and identify it, that builds literacy skills. Can you really find them all? Are they buried in the middle? They are buried in the middle, but there's enough play in it. You have to like manipulate it. And it's because of the, it's, it's also a wonderful sensory thing for kids because it makes so much noise and it has a lot of heft and weight to it. Um, and I did have one kid who found them all. Yeah. I had a lot of kids who found about 50. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we ended up doing that year is anybody who found over 50 got put into the raffle. Mm -hmm. right. How do they you could make it check and found it. We have a sheet and it just has the numbers 1 through 60. It's really hard. <laughs> and we would have kids who would come back and work on it multiple days. So we'd keep their sheets at the library and then they would come back and work on it again. Okay. Um, oh, I have a giveaway. So, I want one. She'll do the drawing. Okay, you can model it for me. Put up your that hand, please. Okay, put your hand. Down. So, um, at the Plot Library, we did a conference uh, at the end of last week with um, some of our child care providers in our community, educating them about story time practices and kind of promoting our library. And as part of this conference, we had a make and take craft, and we had a couple of people who didn't show up that were registered. So I have the pieces for your very own, hold your hand up nice and high. Can you, can you make a guess what this is a story time book for? What story is it? Is that a bed? Five oh. little monkeys. Right. So can you hold it up nice and high so everybody can see? So um, I really like, these are a nice way to do, um, to kind of get the same feel as a felt board without the grabability of it, because it's on your hand, so you can hide it. Instead of doing one of these moves when you have toddlers who come up to take all of your felt board pieces off. Um, so I have, a, I have a kit with a glove and all the pieces cut out. And um, there's no glue for the eyes and the nose and the mouth. You'll have to provide that yourself. But if you would like to draw a name, Amanda Gates. There you go. <laughs> you now have a Five Little Monkeys kit for you. You're welcome. All right. OK, so my next handout talks about everything that we do at the Platt Library. Can you hand these out to people? I'll hold on to your glove. Is it mine? No, it belongs to the library. But you can play with it today. 
I'm working with data. I'm also the school librarian in town, and so I have access to the reading data um, for the students who've done the summer reading program. And we only have two years' worth of data, but in that small sample set of the kids who've done the summer reading program and that we have data for, they are, they're, they're not experiencing that same dip. So it is really exciting to say, in our own community, in our own data, it's making a difference. <laughs> Um, we do weekly check-ins. We used to do giveaways with uh, tchotchkes from uh, Oriental Trading Company, but last year we piloted a new thing. Um, we give away charms from fitness finders, and I'll have these up here for you guys to look at. They are made in the United States, they are BPA and phthalate free, um, and they come in really cool shapes. Kids who collected, who checked in between four to six times during the program, so uh, every week for four to six weeks, got to come back in August and get a maker kit to take home in a paper bag, which was an activity that was suggested last year. And we had, uh, how many do we have? We had, it's not on here, but we had 23 kids who got that extra prize because they checked in so often. And um, we found that kids were more excited about these than they were about the little tchotchkes from, <coughs> from China that the parents deeply despise. <laughs> Fitness Finders is the name of the company that we buy them from, and the reason why is because they're made in the United States and they're safe plastic. Would you like to play with those? You may. Uh, so the, the next thing that we do, which is I think a kind of cool idea if you haven't done it before, is so during these weekly check-ins, kids say that they've met their goals and they show us the books that they've read, and we record the number of books that they have read. And the books go up on the big board. So last year we were building a better world. So first we built Maker Lake, then we built Thinker Green, then we built Tinker Town. Um, and all of those pieces of paper up there, the clouds, the houses, the green dots, and the blue dots, represent numbers of books that kids have read. Our kids in Shoreham, it's okay. Everybody knows who you are by now. <laughs> um, so our kids last year, at the end of the summer reading program, read 1,988 books. Wow. So, and, and we get a graphic representation to show the rest of the community what they're doing. It's a, it's a, it's a really exciting thing. Um, all of the hammers and tools on the uh, right-hand side, those are all the kids who are registered for summer reading. And they register, they come to the library, they write their name down, and they put it up on the wall. Now, the year prior, we did, let's see, no, that's old. I put a whole bunch of stuff in here. There's, yeah. So the year prior, we did the great reading race. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, and I'm sorry about that. But do you see how each square is there? Each square represented, I think, 25 books, with the goal being that the kids would read 1,500 books. That was the goal. Because in years prior, kids hadn't read that many at all. At each stage, so at 250, at 500, at 750, at 1,000, and at 1,500, there were different prize levels that they could unlock as a group. So these group prizes would be available for everybody. And there are a whole bunch of them listed. The ones that we've done for two years are listed on your worksheet. Well, this first year, they blew past that goal of 1,500 books, and the kids read 1,863 books. So this past year, the goal was 2,000, and they got within you know, 23 books of making that goal, which for me was good, because the final prize was going to be a library lock-in, and I was really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll get the lock-in this year. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to do it this year. It's going to be fine. Um, the last thing that we ended up doing, because our summer reading program had gotten so big, our final party had gotten really big and unwieldy. So what we did last year is we split it into three events that run back to back. The first event is a little kid party for ages three to seven, which had four activity stations, a box maze in the basement, a photo booth with props, Lego building, and a maker kit to take home. Kids come, they circle through the things, take pictures, have fun. The second event, which backed up to it, was an ice cream topping bar, which was a prize that they won with all of the books that they read, and our raffle prize drawing. Because we give out so many raffle prizes, many, uh, I'd say about half of which are donated by the community, we, um, 
We, I do all of that coordination behind the scenes. I'm not drawing tickets. The very first year I did raffle prizes, I drew tickets, and we had a very small summer reading program that year, and three of the kids that were at the final party did not get any prize at all. And I was like, this must never happen again. <laughs> so everybody has to turn in their reading ahead of time. I decide who gets what, so that it, at least everybody gets something they wanted. It might not be the thing they wanted the most, but everybody gets something. And, um, and, uh, blah, 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 blah. and then we do the big reveal at the final party. It's still very dramatic. We clap for everybody. We hand out certificates. We make a big deal out of the time commitment. I know that public librarians have a lot of trouble with the idea of incentivizing reading. They say, reading is its own reward. We shouldn't have to give kids stuff. We're teaching them that the reading is not rewarding. But no. What, in, especially in our community, I feel very strongly. We live in a high poverty area. Our kids do not have a lot of stuff. And what we are doing by incentivizing their attendance at the library, their reading every week, and cheering them on when they meet certain goals is we are setting habits. The reason why my summer reading program is six weeks is because it takes more than 30 days to build a habit. And so what I'm doing is I'm very carefully building the habit of reading with high extrinsic motivation during the summer. So that during the school year, when they're like, oh, I just don't know what to do, their brain will remember that intensive period and they will pick up a book. And anecdotally, all of the kids that participate the highest in summer reading, even if they were not readers before their first year of summer reading, they are now readers. There's one young man that I think of in particular, I don't think I ever saw him reading a book, but he was very motivated by one of the raffle prizes one year. He wanted it. And he worked his butt off and he read all summer long. And then, all of a sudden, I saw him in school, coming into the library, during the time when his class wasn't supposed to be there, saying, well, I finished this book, I need more books. And now he is addicted to reading. He reads all of the time. So, for kids who are young, sometimes it is okay to use extrinsic motivation to build habits. And I don't think that for a six-week summer reading program, we are really telling them that reading is not valuable. Because if it wasn't valuable, how could you how could you not earn all of this stuff? Just by just, it's fun. It makes it fun. And it's mm -hmm. fun. But if you have any, you might have people in your community who feel very strongly about this. And it's it's there's good research there about how extrinsic motivation, so getting rewards for something you're supposed to be doing, helps lay the groundwork for intrinsic motivation. There's actual research from psychologists out there that that is a thing. Okay. Um, okay, we also run, I'm going like way over. I know. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is we run a summer reading program for adults in addition to all of this. Uh, so our adults submit reviews for six weeks when they're reading and listening to um, what they've checked out from the library, either audiobooks or books, regular books. And then they're entered into donated raffle prize drawings for local restaurants. And it's a super easy program for adults. And it, in the past year, it's created a lot of interest. Usually, we have between, uh, I'd say, 12 and 20 people who participate. In this past year, we had almost 30 people who participated in that reading program. Okay. Um, and we also do a reading challenge sheet, which I can tell you about. So, we, anyway, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.